the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Luke, chapter 13. We are thankful to have each of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're thankful that you've come. I trust you feel welcome being with us this morning. We're thankful to have, again, we're thankful to have Brother Kenny, his family with us as well. Thankful that he could be uh, here in the service. Luke chapter 13. We want to begin reading in verse 20. Luke chapter 13, and we'll begin in verse 20. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the day and for the blessings of life that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for the many things that you've done for us. I thank you for Jesus, that through him we could have eternal life. Lord, I pray that you would bless this morning as I try to deliver the message, Lord. I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to say the things that I need to say. And, Lord, I pray you would keep me from saying the things I shouldn't. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts that we could receive your word. I pray, Lord, for the lost that they could see their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity. Lord, I pray you would work in their hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, for the requests that were mentioned. You know each one and each need. And again, Lord, I pray that you would help me as I try to deliver the message for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 13 and verse 20. And again, he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leaven. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, then said one unto, unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and you began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. I'm going to stop there with verse 30. Here Jesus is teaching and we, we want to deal pri primarily with the question that was asked in verse 23 and then Jesus' answer in response to this question here in verse 23. But before we get to uh, this question, I think it's important that we go back and look at what Jesus has taught and been teaching, uh, specifically in this 13th chapter of the book of Luke. Uh, Jesus here, as he uh, teaches, has, has taught some things that are very different than what the Pharisees have been teaching. Now, I know we're all aware of that, uh, and, and these people, of course, one of the things that uh, drew people to Christ. One of the things that uh, the reasons that Jesus had so many followers was because of not only his style of teaching, but the way he or, or the words that he taught, what he taught. It was completely different than uh, anything these people had heard before, maybe in, in their time. And so as you go back and you begin to look at some of the things that Jesus taught, you consider the Pharisees at least for a moment. Let, let me just say this. When you go back and look at Abraham, and you look at men before Abraham, it is, uh, it, it's, it's apparent that these men understood at that time that they were going to need a Redeemer and that they could not uh, measure up to God's standard of perfection. In other words, they couldn't be saved in and of themselves. They needed somebody to redeem them. Uh, Job, you think about for a moment, Job had no scripture at all. Job didn't even have, uh, from what we can see and what we can understand, had, had no piece of scripture to go back and read or refer to, and yet Job understood. He made the statement, he said, I know my Redeemer, I know my Redeemer liveth, and he shall dwell in the earth in the latter day, 
and those, the skin worms destroy my body, my eyes shall he, see him, or I shall see him rather, with mine own eyes and not another. And so Job understood that he had a Redeemer. How did, how did this take place? I don't believe I have all the answers to that. I believe God revealed it to him in some manner or way. But these men understood, Abraham understood that he needed a Redeemer. And this is a, a message that had been taught. And now the, the Pharisees are, have, have been teaching that they're good enough because they are the children of Abraham. In John chapter 8, Jesus addresses that very issue and telling them that they're not going to re be received into the kingdom simply because they are the children of Abraham. John the Baptist taught the same thing in Matthew chapter 3. He says, come, bring forth... They were wanting to be baptized of John. He said, bring forth their fruit, meat for repentance, and say not that we have our fathers to Abraham. And so, they were, they were teaching that just simply because they were the children of Abraham, because they lived good lives according to the law, they followed the law, that they were going to be received in the kingdom just because of that. And Jesus then began to tell them that that's not so. That they needed a Redeemer. And Christ Himself was that Redeemer. And so, I want you to notice a few things in, in chapter, back in chapter 13 here, in, in verse 2, Jesus is speaking in this particular place of some Galileans. Now, I believe he's speaking of Judas of Galilee, uh, who was killed. Uh, and these people looked down on them because of the circumstances of why he was killed. Also, in verse 4, you'll notice that there were other, uh, an, another 18 people that a tower in Salaam fell on. And the mindset of these people was, look what God allowed to happen to them. Look what God allowed for them. Consider these, these people where the tower fell on them. They were, their mindset was God allowed these 18 people a tower to fall on them. And so maybe they should have been serving God. Or maybe they should have been doing better. And, and maybe if they were serving God better and it would, would have done the things that they needed to, then this tower wouldn't have fell on them. That was their mindset concerning these people. And then Jesus tells them, except ye all likewise, or excuse me, except ye repent, he says here in verse 5, I take you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In other words, that you're no different than they are. Well, this is something that, that, that they were taken aback at. It was something different than they had ever heard before. And then he goes on to talk about, in verse 6, he, he begins to talk about the fig tree. John the Baptist preached a very similar statement. John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 makes a statement that the axe is laid to the, to the root of the tree. Well, what's he saying? In other words, it's time to bring forth some fruit or be cut down. Well, that's the same thing that Jesus is teaching here, that there's a fig tree that a man has in a vineyard. And when they sought fruit from the fig tree, there was none. And so the man sought to cut the tree down. But one told him and, and said, well, let me work about the tree and let me see if I can work on it and, 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 and chase and train this tree. And maybe in, in, in a few, three, two, three years, we can get some fruit out of it. So he, he begins to work on the tree and he begins to put dung around the tree and he begins to try to train the tree. And they find out after three years there's nothing that's done and nothing has changed. It's still not bringing forth any fruit, so cut it down. And what he's speaking about specifically here in this parable is the nation of Israel. That the time has come that they need to be bearing fruit because they have become unfruitful as a nation. They have become unfruitful as God's people and either they need to begin to bear fruit or God's going to cut them off. Which is exactly what He did. Verse 18, verse 20, we have two parables that are given. The parable of the grain of mustard seed and the parable of leaven. The parable of the grain of mustard seed. The mustard seed, of course, was the smallest of seeds that were planted in, at that time. But yet it produced the, the greatest plan. It grew up into the greatest plan. To, to be such a small seed. And so Jesus compares the kingdom of God to that. And He says that it has a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast in his garden. It grew and waxed a great tree. And the fowls of the air lodged in, in the branches of it. In other words, the fowls of the air are those that... Uh, the, 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 the devil, if you will, and, and his angels, and those that are following the devil. 
And again, you get this picture of the nation of Israel that in the beginning it was, it was simply pure and it was simply just, just uh, a, 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 a mustard seed that would come up and a mustard plant and uh, uh, one that would bear fruit and be to, to enjoy. But eventually it got to the place that it was this uh, obscurity almost, if you will, this big obscure plant that, that the devils are, are lodging in its branches. And they said, well, you're talking about the nation of Israel. When Jesus told the Pharisees, He said, you are of your father the devil and his work you will do. Eleven, the same way that they took this message that, again, you go back to Abraham, it's this very simple idea that one day they would need a Redeemer and that they would believe in the, the Redeemer that was to come. And Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Job also believed and he was saved. And time and time again we see this. And now it's of the idea that we, we're okay because we're of the children of Abraham and we're okay because we keep the law and we do good and we don't need any help. We get the mindset of the Pharisee as he would pray with the publican and he would say, you know, I thank thee that I'm not like these other folks that, 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 that I, I do what I'm supposed to do. And you see the pride in that. And the leaven has come and leaven always represented sin. And the leaven has come and corrupted the whole thing. And corrupted the whole kingdom as, as, as the nation of Israel was. And I believe what he says, it's time to cut it off. And so this man comes to ask Jesus a question. And I think that, that you know, that so many of them were taken aback at this different message. That this man comes and he asks the question in verse 23. And said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Is there, just, is there not, not many people going to be saved? Seems like a simple question, and I don't know the man's sincerity. I don't know where he, to what degree or, or why he was asking the question. Jesus uh, is, is amazing as, as he you know, these people asked Jesus these questions. Jesus was aware. He, he knew exactly why they would ask Him. He knew their sincerity. He knew if they were trying to cause trouble with Him or, or, or back Him into a corner with their words and, and ask Him a, kind of a pointed question. But Jesus was aware of all of that. So I know, no doubt Jesus was aware of why this man was asking this question, but from what we could see, it, 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 you know, we're, we're not sure. The man just asked him, are there not, not going to be real, a, a whole lot of people that are saved? And so Jesus goes on to answer the question. And as Jesus answers it, he, he answered it somewhat indirectly. And Jesus would often do this as, as people would, you know, I, I, think, I think sometimes you look at Peter and some of these other disciples, I think I would have been a little... Scared to just ask Jesus a question just right off the cuff. Because he'd sometimes take the question that you ask and make an example of you in front of everybody, you know. Because he used these as an opportunity to teach the people that were, were, that were there. And, and that's what he's doing here. Peter didn't seem to be bothered too much by it because he would always ask the question and, and Jesus would, would answer it, you know, in front of everybody. Can I embarrass Peter if you would? Now this man asked this question and so are there a few that are going to be saved? How, how many people are going to be saved? I, I, I think we probably most of us have enough Bible knowledge that we could, we could probably about answer the question. Are there going to be a few people saved? I, from what I can see in the Scripture, there's going to be more people that go to hell than go to heaven. Because broad is the, the way. And wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many, go, many there be, the Scripture says, that go in there at. Because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. I believe Jesus pretty well answered the question already. And I believe we can, if we, we've got enough Bible knowledge to know that Probably not going to be just a great number of people. I mean, it's going to be, it, the Scripture says innumerable multitude of people, but there's going to be more that go to hell than go to heaven. 
So what number that is, I don't know. But this man is asking this question. Right? How many are going to go? Or is, is there only going to be a few that go in comparison? Do we think, you know, here's all of these that are of the, this, this kingdom and all of Abraham's folks. Are there, there are only going to be a few that are going to, going to make it. And so Jesus then begins to answer his question. This morning, I want you to look at this question with me for a moment. And what Jesus tells him here is, first thing he says in verse 24, he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Now he turns, in, I want you to notice, at the end of verse 23, the scripture says, and he said unto them. So he turned and said this unto, he wasn't just answering this man, he's answering everybody again. And so he tells them to strive to enter in at the straight gate. Now that's interesting. Because this man asked him, are there going to be few that are saved? And Jesus says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Well, why did He say that? I think what Jesus is trying to say in some manner of speaking is, rather than worrying about how many are going to go, if there's only going to be a few or not, or worrying about how many is going to be able to get there, you just need to make sure that you're in that number. You need to make sure that you're in the fold. That you're the one who gets to get into the gate. This morning, I, I want to ask you that question. How do you know that you're going to heaven? If you died right now, if you died this morning, where would you spend eternity? You may, you may sit this morning and, and think that you're going to heaven. I, I've asked quite a few people that question. I, I've never met too many people that have told me they're going to hell. Occasionally, but most people tell me that they're going to heaven. Now that stands very contradictory to what we just mentioned, right? Because there's more people that's going to go to hell than go to heaven, right? According to the Scriptures. But yet today there's more people that, that end up... You go, go to the funeral home and, and, and sit and listen as people come through and they preach the funerals. How many of them do they stand up and preach? Well, they didn't make it. But we know that's the case, right? There was a man, there was a man I, I, I heard made a statement. I, I think he worked at a funeral home over somewhere toward the house. And he had gotten with whole, just frustrated with the whole idea of, of everything. And somebody had asked him why. He said, well, I've been working here for, I don't know, 20 years or so. He said, and all the time I worked here, he said, I ain't never heard anybody get up and preach anybody in hell. He said, everybody that they preach going to heaven. He said, no, I know that ain't true. This morning, it just bullet. I can't do, what, what about you? This morning, I'm not trying to look at everybody else. We're trying to look at ourselves and, and, and examine ourselves this morning. Where do you stand with the Lord? And you may say this morning that I'm going to, I'm going to heaven. And what are you basing that on? What's, what's, what's that based on? Do you believe that you're going to heaven because you're a good person? Some of the Pharisees were some of the most moral people that's ever lived. And Jesus told them that they were of their father the devil. So you believe this morning you're going to heaven because you, you've lived a pretty good life? It's not good enough. I want you to consider for me, uh, with me for a moment the thief on the cross. When you think about the thief on the cross, one of the reasons I enjoy that example so much is because the man literally did nothing. He never went to a church service. He never got baptized. He never did one thing for Jesus Christ. In fact, just minutes before he trusted Jesus Christ, he was mocking Jesus. Matthew records that both men, both benefactors on either side of Jesus, were both mocking him. And Luke then records that one of them had a change of heart. So just moments before the man saved, that he's, he's just basically being ugly to Jesus. Never did anything in his life. And yet he, he, he's in paradise. He's in heaven. And how did he get there? Well, he didn't get there because he lived a good life. He didn't get there because he was a church member. He didn't get there because he got baptized. He got the, there's only one thing he's got. That's Jesus Christ. There's nothing else. Maybe this morning you say to yourself, you know, I, I, I'm doing okay. I'm going to be okay because I've lived a pretty good life. 
That's simply not the case. Let me tell you this. Maybe this morning you... you, you I, I, I try to be careful about pressuring folks that, that are lost. I, I, I really don't want to do that. But I believe I've seen some people just to, just to get the pressure off of them have made a profession of faith just to get people to quit talking. This morning you can make all the professions of faith that you want to. And you'll die and go to hell if you've never trusted Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning you made your profession of faith and maybe you've come up here and, and, and you've made the statement that you had trusted Jesus but you really never did. This morning, how do you know that, that you're going? How do you know that you're included? And so Jesus is telling him, rather than worrying about all of the number and all of that, you, you make sure that you're going. What, I, I'll tell you a song that I, you know, y'all know that I play guitar and kind of like bluegrass, bluegrass, excuse me, bluegrass music a little bit. One of the big gospel songs of bluegrass music is Will the Circle Be Unbroken? Now, in its original form, Will the Circle Be Unbroken sounds a whole lot different than the bluegrass that you hear. The lyrics, and what I mean by that is the lyrics have been changed. There are, I think, four, four, four or five verses of the song originally as it was originally written. And I really go, like going back to look at the original version of that song because it's, it's asking a question. And, and what it's asking, and I, I, I'm not going to try to get word for word. I probably won't even get close. But to give you the gist of the song, what it's asking is, you know, I, I remember times as a child that on Sundays I'd go to my grandmother's house. And it was, a, it was just a tradition for us. After church, we went to my grandmother's house and we ate. And, and we got around the piano after lunch and we sang. So you get this idea of the family and all of those people that are there. And, and, and what was going on as we would gather around the piano. Today, if we did that, it would look a whole lot different than it used to. Both of my grandparents have passed away. Now, according to their profession of faith, they're with the Lord. The question that the song is presenting is will you be there? Or will the circle be broken? Will the family be intact? Or will you be the one that's missing when eternity comes? Will the circle be unbroken? Well, the, the point of the song is to get us to examine ourselves. To look at ourselves. And, and rather than, 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 than for a moment being concerned about others, we look to ourselves and say, okay, am I really going? So he says strive. Jesus used the word strive to enter in. Let, let me just back up for a moment. Let me go back for a moment, just a moment, to uh, this idea of what you depend on or what you're banking your salvation on. And you may say this morning, I, I've, I've gone to church quite a bit. I, I've been in church all my life, or I've, you know, and that, that's what you're banking on. Or maybe you say, well, I've, I've gotten baptized, and that's what you're banking on. I want you to listen to what Jesus says as He goes on. He tells these men in verse 26 and 27, they say, depart, the door's shut now. Y'all depart from me is what they're told at the end of verse 25. Verse 26, he says, then shall ye begin to say, notice what these men are, are, are saying now at judgment. We have eaten and drunk. We have eaten and drunk in your presence. They didn't just go to a church service. They ate and drank in the presence of Jesus Christ. They didn't just go to a church service and hear some old country preacher preach. They heard the words of Jesus Christ. They listened to Him. They listened to God Almighty preach. 
in Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So I never knew you. So Jesus answers, he says, rather than worrying about how many or whether they're going to be a few or a lot, you make sure you enter. You strive to enter. The word strive is an interesting word. It means fight. Salvation is not a fight, it's a surrender. You surrender to Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does he mean by fight? I'm going to tell you right before, when, you, when the Lord begins to burden you, you're going to feel like there's a fight going on. There's a war that's happening in your head. And one of the reasons, is the same word that he uses here, strive or, or, or fight, it's the same idea of the word James chapter 4 when he says, resist the devil. And what Jesus is telling us that when we are to strive is we are not to strive to do the right thing. We're to strive to keep from going in the way that the devil's telling us to go. You see, because this morning if Jesus is burdening your heart, if He's showing you your need of Jesus Christ, the devil is going to do everything he can to keep you from trusting Jesus. He'll tell you you're okay. He'll tell you how good of a person you've been. And yet you don't need Jesus. He'll tell you all of those kind of things and you're to resist those things. You're to strive against them. Put it away from you. Even of your flesh, your own flesh. Pride will keep you from trusting Jesus Christ. Pride will tell you that you're okay just like you are. And you're going to be fine. And pride will get you right to hell. This morning you need to resist pride in order to be saved. You're not okay without Jesus Christ. You're not okay without Him. You need Jesus to be saved. So Jesus tells them to strive, tells them to strive. But to strive to enter in to the street gate the straight gate is of course a narrow passage and kind of what comes to my mind it's typically in these towns and in these these cities they were fortified cities which means that they just had big walls around them to protect them and all of these cities with these big walls around them had city gates and any person that wants to go in and out of the city goes through the gates that's that's the way in it's the broad way. That's the way everybody goes. But somewhere there's, there's a, a little bit of back door that nobody knows about. And he says, that's the way you need to come in. That's the door. And you need to strive to enter in the straight gate. What, the reason that what Jesus is telling us, the reason He uses this as an example, is not to say that it is a door that's hard to get through. It's not to say it's a door that, 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 that is uh, I- I- extremely difficult to, to try to pass through it. But what he's saying is it's a, it's a door that's easily overlooked. It's a door that's easy to just say, no, nah, I, don't, I don't need that one. I need to go through that way. I'll be okay on this, this path. Notice the wording as Jesus would say, broad is the way, wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be that go in there, in there, excuse me, in there at, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. That find it. What he's saying, the reason he uses this as an example is because not that it's difficult to get through, but it's, it, it, it's very easily passed up. It's easy to put your faith in something else and think you're okay this morning. But the truth is, without Jesus, you're not okay. You're not headed to eternity. You're not going into, in, into the kingdom. And so he's telling these people, look, you, you think you're alright like you are. You think because you're the father, or you're, rather you're the children of Abraham, that you're fine, but you're not. This morning the same is true with us. You may, be, you may be the child of a good man. You 
You may be a child of, of great godly parents and still die and go to hell if you refuse Jesus Christ. I love my daughter, both of them. And I want to do everything that I can to see them in eternity one day. But I can't trust Jesus for them. She's going to have to trust Jesus by herself. She's not going to heaven because she's the daughter of a preacher. Neither one of them. You don't get into heaven for that. The only way to have eternal life is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And so what Jesus is answering and telling this man is to strive. You make sure you get into that gate. You make sure, rather than worrying about how many, rather than worrying about all of this, you make sure you're going. You make sure you get in. He goes on to say this in verse 25. He says, when once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. What Jesus is telling us is there's coming a time that that door is going to be closed. I don't know when that time is. Sometimes I wonder if that door of opportunity is going to be closed all at one time. Or if it's closed on each individual differently. And maybe a little bit of truth on both of it. But the fact is that one day, your opportunity to trust Jesus Christ will be over. One day, and you see this door, the same door as, I'll kind of get, I get the same picture, he talks about shutting the door as God shut the door of the ark. And that all these people were worrying and, 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 and looking and kind of putting down on knowing, you know, that, ain't nobody going in that ark. Just a very few people knowing them other ones he got going in there with him, his three sons and daughter in laws, the only ones going in there. And rather than worrying about who should go in, they should be rather doing their best to make sure they got in there before it started raining. And you know what the best way to do that is? The best way to get in there before it starts raining and the door's closed? To do it today. To do it right now. Well, you have the opportunity. Repent. Cry out to the Lord for mercy. Through Jesus Christ today, you could be saved. Today, God's made a way for us to have eternal life one way. And that way is through His Son. There is no other way of eternal life outside of Jesus Christ. And today, rather than concerning yourself about a lot of other things... You make sure that you're going. Let me mention this. One other thing. I want to talk to the church members here. If you're here and you're a member at Lone Star Baptist Church, I want you to listen to me for a moment. If you're a member of any church, rather, Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 it's the, that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart the faith. I want you to understand what it means to depart the faith. There's a difference between an apostasy and backsliding. Backsliding is when a child of God is saved. He knows what he's supposed to do. He knows how he should live. And yet he chooses not to live that way. Backsliding is when a child of God, rather than going to church as he should, just decides to stay at home. Backsliding is when a child of God pulls away from the life that they're supposed to live. Apostasy is when a person who has made a profession of faith says, I don't believe that anymore. There's a complete difference between the two. The apostasy and what the Spirit is saying is that there's coming a time where some are going to depart the faith. In other words, that they're going to say, I don't believe that anymore. The reason I mention that this morning is because I believe this with all my heart. If you are a child of God, you believe yourself rather to be saved, you made that profession of faith. 
And you say, I don't believe it anymore, and you walk away. I believe you were ever saved to begin with. I believe I've got Bible to back that up. 1 John chapter 2, and I believe it's verse 20, makes the statement that they went out from us. They left us. They departed us. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20 said that they went out from us, that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. In other words, they were never saved to begin with, and they left us, God proving and showing that they were never of us to begin with. Hebrews chapter 6 proves it shows the same idea. What I, the reason I mention that is that just because you're a church member doesn't mean you're saved. And you say, well, who's, who's going to apostatize and, and who's going to do this and depart the faith? You just make sure you don't. And rather make sure you can't. Make sure you've trusted Jesus. You examine yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us in verse 28 that before we partake in the communion service that we examine ourselves to see whether we can eat and drink or rather that we wouldn't eat and drink unworthily. Unworthily doesn't mean unworthy. Unworthy means that we're unworthy. I'm unworthy of anything God's done for me. Unworthily is something completely different. Today we are to examine ourselves. This morning I want you to look in your heart and see whether you know Jesus or not. Don't run from the truth. See what's there. Let God show you this morning. Let God give you assurance or either show you that you need Jesus. This morning if you see that Jesus is not there then you need to strive to enter in that gate. You come to Jesus Christ. You trust Him. And this morning you can be saved while we have a verse of a song.